everyone and thank you so much for joining us. We're genuinely really excited to be here with you this evening. For those of you who are aware, then actually we are super lucky this evening because there's four of us on the call this evening. So I'm joined by the incredibly talented Dr. Chim Wybury from the Primary Care Dermatology Society and the equally incredibly talented Dr. Will Deppin from NB Medical. We have our IT guru and IT producer, Daniel, on the call as well. So if you do have any technical issues that arise throughout the call, please feel free to pop those in the chat as well. For those of you who have joined Will and I before, you will know we love to make these particularly interactive and tonight is no exception. So we've created some potential spin-off game shows, which may or may not make it to a TV screen near you, but we enjoy them and we hope you do too. To introduce ourselves, my name's Philippa. I work as a GP. I also work with Cardiff University on one of their postgraduate dermatology diplomas. And I work with MB Medical. So I write the CPD modules and Will and I co-present the, the NB Medical Dermatology webinar for primary care. This is available live and on demand. Our next live version is the 19th of January 24 and we'd love for you to join us. MB Plus allows you to have access to all of the MB Medical online webinars, as well as the online course books, in addition to all of those appraisal essentials and CPD modules. And for anyone like me who loves a good podcast, then Neil Tucker runs the NB Medical Hot Topics podcast, which is free and well worth a listen to. MB Medical have also created the NB On Call app. This is available to download on your phones and it's also available on the MB dashboard as well. You do need a GMC number to sign up, but once you've signed up, then it is a platform where you can openly share your clinical and non-clinical cases, and you can draw upon the collective experience of our peers. Now, I mentioned we're incredibly lucky because we're joined by the amazing Chin Wybury. So I'm going to hand over to Chin to introduce herself. Evening, Chin. Hello, Philippa. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I am Chin Wybrew and I'm a GP in Cheltenham and I do lots of dermatology and particularly dermoscopy teaching both for the Cardiff Dermatology Diploma, Cardiff Dermoscopy course and also in my role as dermoscopy lead for the Primary Care Dermatology Society or PCDS. And I shall hand over to Will to introduce himself. Good evening, Chin, and good evening to you at home. It's amazing to see so many of you join us. There were over 1,700 signups for this webinar, which speaks to what an incredible topic this is and the expertise we've got in, in Chin and Philippa. Hello to you in West Wexford, Dublin, West Sussex, Somerset, Preston, from all over the, the UK and beyond. Uh, so I'm Will Duffin. I'm a jobbing GP. I've maintained an interest in dermatology. I did the London Diploma, and I... Uh, 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 led on getting a advice and guidance teledermatology service set up in Cornwall from pilot to fully commissioned uh, service. That was my proudest achievement, I think, in my current medical career. And I also continue to dabble in dermatology, but I definitely wouldn't call myself an expert. And that's what we're here to do tonight is to learn the ropes about dermoscopy. Back to you, uh, uh, Philippa. Thanks so much both. And like I said, just such an honour to have both Chin and Will on the call with us this evening. I'm particularly excited. So just to discuss what we're covering this evening, we're going to start off by discussing what actually is dermoscopy and how is it useful for us in primary care. Chin will run us through the wonders and practical tips of using our dermatoscopes. And then we will both discuss how we interpret some dermoscopy lesions. So to start us off, it is worthwhile just reminding ourselves that when we review a lesion clinically, if there is any element of doubt, it is time to get those dermatoscopes out. I made that up, but it's particularly a useful phrase that I made up anyway. And what we're referring to then is actually what dermoscopy really is. 
So dermoscopy allows us to illuminate the image itself and also it magnifies that image by a factor of 10. And you think, well, why don't I just copy this little guy here and use a magnifying glass with a light? Well, dermoscopy really is so much more than that. Dermoscopy is magic. Dermoscopy is particularly amazing because it does allow us to see one millimeter beyond our skin surface. Amazing when we think about it, really. And we can do this in two different ways. The first First way is with using our polarized dermatoscopes with or without contact fluid. And the second way is using non-polarized light and we must always use contact fluid. So to start us off and to demonstrate this a little bit further, here is a benign mole. This is a benign melanocytic nevus. But just to confirm, we get our dermatoscope out without using contact fluid initially, and we pop that on that mole itself. So we're in non-polarized mode and we're not using contact fluid. What we've done is, yes, we've illuminated the image itself. And yes, we have magnified the image by a factor of 10. But unfortunately, using non-polarized dermoscopy with non without contact fluid, this isn't dermoscopy. If we do not have contact fluid, then we need to be in our polarized mode. And the reason why is your polarized dermoscopy, this is a cross polarized device. And again, particular magic happens here because with this cross polarized device, it allows us to reduce the scatter of light off the surface of our skin. And it also reduces the amount of light reflected off the surface of the skin, increasing light refraction, allowing us to see all of these structures here. And I'm sure we don't need to, um, to look twice to convince ourselves that the image on the right is far clearer than the image on the left. And then we think, actually, I'm going to improve the quality of this image. I'm going to use my contact fluid and rest assured, Chin's going to work her magic and talk us through contact fluid shortly. So we take our dermatoscope off, we pop our contact fluid onto our skin, and then we pop our dermatoscope back on. Now we're back in our non-polarized mode. And can we see here, again, we've just reduced the amount of light reflected off the surface of the skin. We've matched that refractive index with the skin and the air. And look, we're now able to see structures within the stratum corneum itself. So see everything far clearer. Photo on the right then is still your polarized light, but now we're using contact fluid. We've just improved our quality of our image. And also actually we've reduced the amount of light reflected off those surface hairs themselves. What we're now able to see is this symmetrical pigment network. We see this symmetry of structure. And actually we're absolutely able to reassure this is a benign mole, benign melanocytic nevus. If you were wondering, well, what mode should I actually be in, particularly those of us who have hybrid dermatoscopes? What we're looking at then is it really depends on the structure of the skin lesion that we're looking at. Now, the key feature with this is that your polarized dermoscopy, this allows us to penetrate the skin more deeply. So as a result, we're able to see deeper structures in polarized mode. Now, if we take a lesion such as a seborrheic keratosis, this is a benign keratinizing lesion, but it's an epidermal structure. So as a result, therefore, ideally, actually, you want to be a non-polarized dermoscopy because this penetrates the skin less deeply, so we see less deeper structures. Now, just to demonstrate, on both photos here, we're able to see that sharply demarcated edge. But look at non-polarized dermoscopy with contact fluid. Can you see those beautiful milia-like cysts, those shiny white structures that are jumping out at us, and those brown to black comedo-like openings? both features of a Seb K. Interestingly, if you have a polarized dermatoscope, then you can actually flick between your two modes. So you can flick between polarized and non-polarized. And those milia-like cysts, they jump out at you like stars in the midnight sky. And that's known as blink sign. So quite a nice trick to try in clinic. Now, going back to the principle then of when we're looking at deeper structures, ideally we want to be in our polarized mode. Now, sadly, there are certain structures such as um, what we see in our melanomas, for example, where it, we're expecting to see certain features such as white lines. Now, white lines are particularly visualized far clearer using our polarized dermoscopy. 
the reason for this is if you look at the periphery of the photo on the right, can you see those white lines which are parallel and perpendicular to each other? This represents fibrin within the dermis. So again, deeper structures, we want to be in our polarized mode so that we're able to see these far clearer. And actually, we can't see them in our non-polarized dermoscopy. In both photos, absolutely, we can see photos of those or features of those irregular vessels. And interestingly, we can see this blue-white veil. Now, blue-white veil implies that there is overlying orthokeratosis. What this means in clinical principles is very sadly for this lady here, it means that her melanoma will actually be a thick, invasive melanoma. Now, I'm sure for all of us, if we saw dermoscopy images and even clinical photos like this, then absolutely, we would be referring this through on that two-week wait pathway, and that's completely appropriate here. Now, I mentioned we're going to make these particularly interactive, so you should have noticed a pop-up appear, and you've got a choice of A, B, C, or D. Just to explain, there's a tiny little lag between when you click and when the answers come in. So as soon as you know the answer, feel free to click away. You're anonymized, so rest assured from that point of view. What we're looking at here, and I'm sure we all agree, that actually all of these look like ugly ducklings, don't they? What we're actually asking is three of these are benign lesions, but one of these is very sadly a melanoma. Are you able to identify just from clinical photo alone which one could be our melanoma? Now, just to explain, this is a particularly difficult round, and also the whole point is just to demonstrate very shortly the huge advantages of dermoscopy, and all will become clear very, very shortly. So I'm going to have a look at the polls to see how we're looking, to see what, what are your thoughts, what do we think is more likely here to be our melanoma, and therefore the other three we can reassure, because actually they're benign lesions. I'm going to have a look through on those polls. And I tell you what, we'll, we'll move forwards now just to see. Thank you so much, everyone. That's excellent. So these are really very sensible differentials coming through. Now, the whole point of this is just to show us, look how much clearer our images are when we use dermoscopy. So very sadly, we'll see that was our melanoma. However, can we see with images A, B, and D, we are now able to reassure these patients. So image A was our SEB case, so seborrheic keratosis. We've got our million like cysts, those comedo-like openings, and that well-demarcated periphery. More on this shortly. Then photo B was our hemangioma, and I do think that out of all of them, that did look particularly like an ugly duckling. Um, but actually, look, we've just popped our dermatoscope on, beautiful looking eye, and then also you've got that fibrous stroma. More on this shortly too. And then photo D is actually a benign melanocytic nevus. So this is a dermal nevus with your cobblestone type pattern. Now, photo C, though, was a melanoma. And just to demonstrate to all of us, look how clear this is when we pop our dermatoscopes on these images here. And actually, we therefore just demonstrated why dermoscopy really is so helpful. So we're able to improve not only the, our recognition and referral of those suspicious pigmented lesions, but also we've reassured for our benign lesions and therefore reduce our referral to our fantastic dermatology colleagues. It's also really helpful to assist with the diagnosis of our non-melanoma skin cancers and even your precursor lesions such as AK and Bowen's as well. As Will alluded to earlier, for those of us that have advice and guidance in our area, it allows us to send through particularly high quality images to our brilliant dermatology colleagues, which improves the response we receive back. And interestingly, it can also be useful to help with the diagnosis of inflammatory skin lesions and is even gold standard for scabies. Makes me itch a little already. So I'm going to hand over to Will to see how we're doing on the Q&A. How are we looking, Will? Thanks, Philip. I hopefully, hopefully you're starting to see 
the, the mosque appears this window into this incredible microscopic world. And uh, the, already, Philip, we're getting questions around the practicalities and rest assured we're going to come on to there's lots of you asking about, you know, what kind of dermatoscope should I get? Can I get dermatoscopes that connect to my iPhone? Yes, all of those things exist. And there is a bewildering array of different devices and products and uh, methods that you can use. Uh, and we'll come on to that in, in just a moment. Lots of questions around this, this concept of contact fluid and polarized light. Essentially, a, a dermatoscope in its essence is just a light source with 10 times magnification. And that light source has the option of polarization, which overcomes the reflective qualities of the stratum corneum, so you can see deeper into the skin. If you're doing dry dermoscopy, which is quick and easy, then you want polarized light because it allows that light to penetrate deep into the skin. You can see more detail. You can see those deeper structures beneath the stratum corneum. But if you want to use some kind of um, uh, gel, uh, alcohol gel is what I use, just isopropyl gel that you get from a hand sanitizer. Most people use that. You stick that on the skin, you roll the dermatoscope onto the skin, and then you don't actually need polarized light anymore because that, that inter the air interface has gone and the light can, isn't going to get reflect, refracted around. If the lesion is on the eye near the eye where the gel is going to irritate the eye or on the nail, you're better off using ultrasound gel. That works really, really well and is quite uh, easily available. So just a couple of questions have come in there. Please keep them coming in. I'll just say there's 1,700 of you signed up, so I'll do my very best to, to cover as many questions as I can. But yeah, love your energy and enthusiasm. Keep it coming. Philippa, back to you. Oh, it's back to me, actually, Will. Oh, back to you, Chin. Yeah, off you go. That's OK. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about types of dermatoscope. And as you can see, I'm a bit of a collector of dermatoscopes. Um, this is a selection of my scopes. I have others, but these are just the ones that you are potentially more likely to be thinking about um, getting in primary care. And just as bringing on from that from that question about getting scopes and what scopes to buy, that QR code there, and we'll put a link for you um, into the Q&A, that QR code will take you to a presentation that tells you all about what features of a dermatoscope to look for. And there is also links on the PCDS website to a spreadsheet that tells you which different scopes have these different features, because there is quite an overwhelming array of possible dermatoscopes that you can get. But basically, they come into three types. So there is the contact fluid only, which has non-polarized light. There is the polarized only, which doesn't have an end plate and doesn't have non-polarized light. And then there's the vast majority of them, which are hybrid scopes, which will do both. And if you're not sure which mode to be using, the best thing to do is to use some contact fluid, put the scope on and flick it between the two modes and just see if it looks different in the two different modes. So a few practical tips then on dermoscopy. And this is real practical stuff. So if you are sharing a dermatoscope within the practice, then it's important that you keep it somewhere safe, but also where everyone who needs to use it can find it easily. So we keep ours in a cupboard, which has a keypad code to it so that anyone can go and get it. And we keep ours, each scope is in a little tray with a charger and with an adapter to attach it to your phone. And what we ask people to do is to charge it each time before putting it back away in the cupboard in the hope that occasionally people will actually remember to do that. And if they do, sometimes it'll get a decent charge because people always forget to put it back in the cupboard. A few other practical tips. Unfortunately, they're quite delicate things, dermatoscopes. And if you drop them, they break. So try not to. And you need to clean the end plate regularly. So you need to clean the outside of the end plate, this bit here, with a, a alcohol swab in between every patient anyway. Um, but some of them will have an enclosed end plate like this one, but other scopes will have a non-enclosed end plate like this one. And with this type of scope, you do need to make sure that you take the end plate off to clean the inside of it, because if it gets dust on there, then your camera will actually want to focus on the dust and not on the lesion. Once you've cleaned the scope, the next step is to clean the patient. And if a patient comes in with a scab like this, although scabs are very, very beautiful on dermoscopy, actually it doesn't tell you much about what lies underneath it. So a wet paper towel gets that scab off and then we can put the scope on and we can see enough information here to tell that this lesion is a BCC. 
If you've got a dry lesion, on the other hand, you can have one like this, where there are some black blotches here that look quite worrying. However, in this case, these black blotches are actually just dead flakes of skin. And the easiest way to get rid of them is with micropore tape. So you just get the micropore tape and you stick it on top of the lesion, peel it off, stick it on, peel it off, do that a few times until it comes away clean. That's going to be three or four times. And then put your scope back on. And as you can see here, there are now no black blotches. They were all artifact. They were just flakes of dead skin. Now, with any scope, the key things you need to know how to do are how to switch it on. So some will have an obvious on off switch like that one. Others have no obvious on off switch. And you just have to kind of feel around until you find something you can press and then something happens. Switching it on is important. You need to know how to switch it between modes. And on most scopes, it will be labelled somehow. If you have a scope and you're not sure how to use it, see if you can identify what scope it is and then have a look at my reviews of dermatoscopes on the PCDS YouTube channel, because for all the scopes I have, I've done a review of them where I show people how to use it. You also need to know how to extend the end plate. That's important because the way you focus the scope is by moving your magnifying glass closer to or further away from the skin. But because it needs to be in contact with the skin all the time, you do that by extending or retracting the end plate. And that is how we focus the dermatoscope. Next thing you need to know how to do is how to apply the contact fluid. And there are two main types of contact fluid that I would use. They would be the alcohol gel, or you can use ordinary lubricating jelly as well. Ultrasound gel is something we tend to have less access to, but it's also really useful contact fluid. To apply the contact fluid, it's always best to apply it to the skin rather than to the scope, particularly if you have a scope like this, where you might get bits of fluid down into the body of the scope. And you need to be careful about that because then it becomes impossible to clean. You also need to know how to attach a phone or a camera to the scope. And there are lots of ways to do that. And you need to know how to clean it afterwards. Now, attaching your camera or phone to the scope, there are loads of different adapters for smartphones, lots of different ones. Some of them will fit some scopes, some will fit others. Again, I go through all of that in the reviews of the individual scopes on the PCDS website. Now, when it comes to contact fluid, alcohol swab, so something like a stirette, is great for a flat lesion. And you can just wipe it on the skin, put the scope on, wipe it on the skin, put the scope on. That's lovely because you don't have to clean it off the patient afterwards. And you can also use it to wipe the scope at the end. For most lesions, alcohol gel is handy, but as Will said earlier, you don't want to use that near the eye and you don't want to use that on broken skin either. Sometimes you need something a little bit more viscous. And so lubricating gel can be really helpful for lesions near the eyes, on broken skin, or also on the nail folds. That's another useful place where you need something a little bit more viscous. When it comes to hygiene though, it's really helpful to use disposable end caps, or if you don't have disposable end caps that look like that with your scope, you can just use a bit of cling film. And that's very helpful, for, particularly for lesions that are bleeding or for lesions on mucosal um, surfaces, mucosal membranes. A few more practical tips here. It's very helpful to record what you see. Photos, a photo speaks a thousand words. And so if you can take a photo, often that's actually quicker than trying to write down what you're seeing. And if you're going to use um, your camera, if you're going to use your phone to take your photos, then it's important to use an app. And um, there are lots that are commissioned by various CCGs across the country, or you can use Pando if you have an NHS net email. You do need to take macro shots as well as the demoscopy shots. The demoscopy on its own is not enough. And if you use the QR code or the link below, there's lots of information there on the PCDS website on how to get good quality photos. Another great tip though, if you're taking monitoring photos, take a photo through the scope on the patient's phone so they have a picture too, so that when they go to see the dermatologist, the dermatologists have got a picture there of what it looked like three months ago, because although we attach these pictures to the referrals, they don't always actually get through to the dermatologist at the time that they're doing the clinic. 
Another thing that you can do, of course, is you can take the photo on the patient's phone. And then if you send them an Accurix text, that will then let them reply to that and send the photo straight into their notes. And that's another safe way to do it where you don't need to be worrying about the data protection issues with taking pictures on your phone. So as I was saying, always get a distant macro, a close up and the demoscopy photo. Because a demoscopy photo on its own, like this, well, I mean, I can see that that's a BCC, but I don't know how big it is and I'm not sure where it is. If I have a clinical photo, that helps a lot. And in this case, I've got something that's giving you an idea of how big it is, my finger. Ideally, of course, you would have a ruler or something with a, with a measuring scale to see how big it is. But in fact, actually, I don't always have a ruler to hand and I usually have my left index finger to hand. And so pointing at the lesion can be a very helpful thing to do. But when you see the localizing photo, now we can see the context of this lesion on the back and we can see the rest of the skin on the back. So how much sun damage there is there. But we can also see that there is actually another slightly more worrying lesion on the right hand side of this patient's back, which luckily for him was just another BCC. But this is just to remind us that a great number of the melanomas that are diagnosed in the two week wait clinics were not the index lesion that was referred. A lot of them are picked up incidentally on patients who are sent in with other lesions. So a few other tips on optimizing the photo quality. Focus the scope before attaching the camera. That means extending the end plate. It always gives you better quality pictures if you use a liquid interface when you take the photos, even in polarized mode, unless you actually can't use a liquid interface because you've got a polarized only scope that doesn't have an end plate. And in that case, you will always get better quality photos if you just wet the skin with a, an alcohol swab before you actually take your pictures. That QR code there, and there'll be links in the information as well, is for a video on optimizing photo quality. But some of the things that we cover are things like this. So this is just adding in some liquid. So in the top picture, that's a polarized photo without liquid. And those short white lines are artifact from the dry skin surface. As soon as we add some liquid, we can then see that those lines disappear they remove the reflection from that dry skin and those lines disappear. So they are not true polarization specific white lines. Pressure is another thing that can cause problems. And particularly for lesions like BCCs where the blood vessels are very superficial and that's one of the key features that helps us to diagnose them. It's very easy to press too hard with the end plate and compress those vessels. So with less pressure, the blood vessels can be seen better. And to reduce the effect of pressure, you can either use a viscous contact fluid and make sure not to press too hard, or you can take the end plate off, or if it doesn't come off, you can just retract it and hold the scope at the correct distance from the skin to get a good focus picture. If you've got a steady hand, you might need to rest your hand on the patient's skin to be able to hold it still. A little troubleshooting tip here. If you're seeing pictures that look like this with shadows in them, that's because you've forgotten to extend the end plate. And as you extend the end plate, the shadows disappear. So it's really helpful to have the end plate usually fully extended if you're taking pictures on a phone, and then you're less likely to get the shadows. If you're seeing reflections from the skin surface, like on the left-hand side here, and the other thing that you'll notice on the left-hand side here is that you can see these light beams coming in from the edges, that's because you're using non-polarized light with no contact fluid. So you're not using your dermatoscope as a dermatoscope, you're using it as a magnifying glass. As soon as you switch it to polarized light, even without wetting the skin, those reflections disappear, as do those light beams coming in from the edges. Another great troubleshooting technique is bubbles. And one of the things that you may find is that you see bubbles in your pictures. Now, it's important not to have bubbles if possible, because there are some lesions where what we are looking for are white circles and the bubbles can look just like the white circles. So you'll get fewer bubbles if you apply the fluid to the skin rather than to the dermatoscope. And if you take it off to go and collect your camera and then to come back to take a picture, it's important to just wipe the fluid away from the skin and the scope and reapply it before putting the scope back on. And that way you won't get so many bubbles. And the other great tip for avoiding bubbles is to use a less viscous contact fluid 
such as alcohol gel rather than um so yes alcohol gel rather than the lubricating jelly or ultrasound gel so that's a quick skim through some um troubleshooting techniques and i'm going to hand back to will now for any comments or questions yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Chin. I, I think for, for me, it's it's all about just getting a device that you can use, that you're familiar with, that works with whatever system you use. I mean, just to give you an example, I've got a Welsh Allen um, uh, otoscope and ophthalmoscope, and the, the, the matoscope I use connects onto the same head. So I, it's the same power source. And that for me just works and it's always charged and I never run out of batteries. Um, and then you just want a little case you can keep it in with your bits in it like your alcohol gel and your wipes and stuff and just i just stick a dematoscope there are you chin i stick a dematoscope on absolutely everything that i see and i think that's how you learn is just through using it and doing it and getting a sense of what normal and abnormal looks like there's loads of technical questions about uh, particularly attaching an, an iphone adapter to different brands of dematoscopes and yes you can do that I don't know about you, Chin, but I find them really frustrating because they're very specific to the model of phone. Every time you upgrade your phone, you need to buy a new adapter. I mean, if the Dematic wasn't expensive enough, then you pay for the adapter on top and it you know, quickly adds up. And there are techniques for just holding your phone against the Dematic, particularly if you get the patient to hold the dematoscope on the skin for you, gives you an extra pair of hands, and working out which of the three camera lenses is the actual functioning lens and lining that up with the the, the view finder of the dematoscope, making sure everything is in is in the same plane, you can actually get pretty good images and without the faff. It does just take a bit of practice to, to do that. Um, the, the only other question I'll, I'll, uh, I'll cover off quickly is, can this be utilized? What, the, what is the limit of dermoscopy? We talked about looking at skin lesions and that is the, the primary application is differentiating benign from malignant neoplastic lesions but there's inflammoscopy which helps you to uh, identify inflammatory dermatoses things like psoriasis and then another delegate's asked can it be utilized for fungal or parasitic skin infections and the answer is yes that's an area of derm dermoscopy called entodermoscopy and there are well-described patterns uh looking at features for uh, parasitic skin infections, things like nits and scabies and viruses and fungi. So yes, there is an application there as well. It's very much an emerging area, but we're really trying to focus on the, the getting the basics right here on this course, which is why we're placing a lot of emphasis on just getting good quality images so you can start looking at real skin and getting a feel for how it all works. Definitely start your focus and your learning on examining skin lesions rather than worrying about those other slightly more esoteric uh, areas of dermoscopy. Chin, anything else you'd want to, to add to all of that? I think you've covered that beautifully. And I think the key thing when it comes to the different scopes and taking photos, um, if you've got a phone with multiple cameras, you're absolutely right. You need to check which camera it is. There are a few other problems that people can have sometimes with multiple cameras where it flicks between one camera and another. And there are some changes you can make in the settings to sort that issue out. And, and I've put that all on the um, PCDS website on that first front page of the demoscopy bit. And when you're holding the camera to the, to the um, phone, what you need to do is just try and make sure that it's lined up enough so that what you're seeing on your screen looks circular rather than oval and then you know that you've got it flat and lined up beautifully but there are so many different adapters you're absolutely right and working out which adapter is going to be the most useful to attach magnetically depends on whether you've got your own phone whether you're sharing um a scope with somebody else there, there are loads of different things but there are some universal adapters that will work with any phone and that will work with most but not all scopes there are some scopes that are different but there's just so many of them so i get asked that question all the time which is the best scope to buy or um or sort of you know which adapters to use and what goes with what and so i've put it all on the pcds website largely as videos, but also as a spreadsheet as well, just to make it easier for people to see that. Lovely, I think we can hand over to Philippa now for the next bit. 
Thanks so much, Jen. Thanks so much, Will. Thank you to each and every one of you for, enga for your engagement. We're absolutely loving the, the questions and answers. So brilliant. Keep, keep them coming. It's, uh, it really gets us thinking as well. And I think what we will now come on to then are our dermoscopy images and how we're going to interpret them. So to start us off, it's really worthwhile just reminding ourselves that actually every image that we look at needs to be viewed in clinical context. So we still need to take a history and we still need to look at the lesion clinically with our naked eye before we pop the dermatoscope on. And then we look at each lesion specifically. So if we're looking at our seborrheic keratoses, these are also known as seb -Ks, seb warts, and our histopathology colleagues refer, these, refer to these as our basal cell papillomas. All the same structure, just different terminology. And you might wonder, well, why do seb -Ks actually cause us a headache? And the reason why is they often fall foul of our ABCD criteria, especially when they're traumatized, especially when they're irritated. So we pop our dermatoscope on. Remember, we're in our non-polarized mode using our contact fluid. And what we're able to see is this very well demarcated periphery. They're epidermal structures. So as a result, we're seeing that they have this stuck on type of appearance with that rough waxy surface. We're then able to see as the arrows are depicting your milia like cysts, so those shiny white structures and your comedo-like openings. Now, really interestingly, your comedo-like cysts and milia-like opening or milia-like cysts and comedo-like openings, they're the same structure. So they are flat sheets of keratin that is whirled and swirled around together. And when it's made it to the epidermis then and it's oxidized by the air, then this then forms your comedo-like openings. And that's because the air has turned those sheets of keratin brown to black in color. And it looks like a chocolate chip muffin. And it looks like those chocolate chips, they've just penetrated through the surface. So they're, um, they're jumping out to us. So those chocolate chips that we can see there, those are comedo-like openings. And then your milia-like cysts, you might wonder, why are they white? Well, actually, it's because keratin is white. So that's why we visualize them as white. Our second feature when we're looking at our Seb Ks, particularly if you've got a flat or relatively thin Seb K, is we look at these thick pigment bands. The photo on the left then, because we're looking for particular patterns with our pigment bands. So photo on the left shows a linear type pattern. Photo in the middle has two patterns actually. So if you look more to the right, then you're able to go see that coral reef like pattern. So coral like pattern. And then photo still in the middle, but slightly more to the left. Can you see with an eye of faith and a little bit of an imagination, it looks a little bit like a brain. So you could say it's a cerebriform type pattern. And then photo on the right, this is a circle type pattern. Now in fairness, the photo on the right actually is easier to visualize that this is going to be a Seb K because it's starting to thicken up. So you can already see those milia-like cysts, those comedo-like openings that are forming there. Now, our third feature when we're looking at our sub -Ks are our vessels, particularly easier to see if we've got a non-pigmented sub -K. So photo on the left here, can we see those hairpin vessels? They look like looped vessels with a white yellow halo surrounding them. If we look at this image here, particularly between five and seven o'clock at the periphery of that lesion, those are the vessels that you're looking for. And now you know what they look like. If you look throughout the lesion, actually, they are regularly distributed in that monomorphic type distribution. And photo on the right, you might think, why have we included photos of frogs? Well, there is a reason. If you look at the if you look at the Seb K head on or end on, then those vessels they actually look like frogs' eggs or frog spawn, and it's the same principle. So these vessels they're arranged regularly in that monomorphic arrangement throughout the whole of your Seb K. Our hemangiomas, interestingly, these are actually the most benign, a common overgrowth of a skin lesion in, in humans. And what we're looking for then is an overgrowth or an outpouching of our blood vessels. They are very soft on palpation, they're compressible, 
and actually they're blood colored. So when we're referring to the colors themselves, if we look at the photo on the left, so cherry angioma or your Campbell de Morgan spot, then these are red, pink in color. And when we look at other hemangiomas, absolutely, they can be blue and they can be purple. Interestingly, they can be black, and that is if they have been thrombosed. Couple of key learning points. First is they can never be brown and they can never be gray. And if we see those colors, this is not a hemangioma. Second feature then is, interestingly, your outpouchings of blood vessels. They're also known as lacunae or blobs of blood. And actually, that's what they look like when you're looking at that dermoscopy image. Now, these lacunae, they're separated by transparent lines, which are known as fibrous stroma. And they keep those blobs of blood or those lacunae in their own unique place. And also, it allows us to have that very sharply well demarcated edge, which we see with our hemangiomas. Interestingly, and second learning point with hemangiomas, we never see overlying surface vessels. If we do, this is not a hemangioma. And sadly, we need to be thinking of differentials, including malignancy in these particular scenarios. Here are some beautiful photos of our dermoscopy images of hemangiomas. And can you see those beautiful different colors that you're able to go visualize? So we have everything from our pinks to our reds to our purples, even some a black color there as well. Another very common benign lesion that we see are our dermatofibromas. Now, these are thought to be a scarring reaction, and essentially it, it is often secondary to minor trauma, such as an insect bite, very common on your limbs. Key feature with our dermatofibromas is that they are palpable from the outset because it's scar tissue. If a patient mentions that they've had a macular flat lesion that has gradually or suddenly started to develop a nodule within it, that is not a dermatofibroma. And again, we need to be thinking of other differentials, including malignancy. So your dermatofibroma there, always palpable from the outset. And the second feature that we then notice is that you end up having this post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation around the periphery itself. And it's this delicate, fine pigment network that is present. And like I said, in terms of its nature, that can be post-inflammatory, but that will always occur post-palpable lesion itself. Remember, your dermatofibromas, they're firm, they're hard, they can be painful, but they're tethered to the skin itself. So if you squeeze either side of that dermatofibroma, then it dimples and the skin is dimpling and that's known as dimple sign. Now look how much clearer though this is when we've popped our dermoscopy on. And what we're, what we're able to see here is we see this central white structural scar-like patch. And we this is fibrosis. So this is always paler than our surrounding skin. And then we're able to see this peripheral pigment network. And this can be quite subtle and quite delicate, but it can be a reticular network, it can be a globular network, but two key features we see with our dermatofibromas. Uh, our next case, which is a sebaceous gland hyperplasia, so in these scenarios, these are overgrowths of your sebaceous glands. These are oil glands of our skin, most commonly of the face, but they do mimic BCCs as demonstrated by this clinical photo here. And what we're looking at then when we pop our dermatoscopes on is we're able to see this central yellow gland opening surrounded by white lobules. And these are similar in size and structure. And when you pop your dermatoscope on, and actually we look at this, we are reminded of marshmallows. So if we see a structure that looks very similar to marshmallows with a surrounding that central yellow gland opening, be thinking actually, could this be sebaceous gland hyperplasia? And then at the periphery, we're looking at these crown vessels. They never cross the central gland opening. And they uh, remember that they never originate from the central gland itself. So come in from the periphery, so crown vessels. I'm going to hand over to Tip to Chin to talk us through our BCCs. Thanks so much, Chin. That's lovely. And as Philippa was saying, sebaceous gland hyperplasia, the main differential diagnosis there is going to be a basal cell carcinoma. They can look really very similar clinically, but luckily the dermoscopy of them is completely different. And I've divided up 
the dermoscopy of BCCs into non-superficial BCCs and superficial BCCs. And the reason for that is there are loads of different types of BCCs, um, lots and lots of different subtypes. But what matters to us clinically is whether they're superficial or not, because the superficial BCCs can be treated medically, but the non-superficial BCCs need to be treated surgically. You can treat any type surgically but only the superficial ones medically. So the non-superficial BCCs, the key features that we're going to find on demoscopy are these sharply focused branching vessels. So in that top right picture, you can see there very nicely the sharply focused branching vessels and the vessels get narrower as they branch, which is supposed to look like a tree. And so we call them arborizing vessels. They're sharply focused because they're right on the surface of the lesion, which means that if you're resting the end plate on them, you can compress them easily. And hence the reason for just being aware of the effect of pressure and either using non-contact um, polarized demoscopy or using a viscous contact fluid and not pressing too hard. Another feature that gives you a clue to the fact that it might be a non-superficial BCC is some larger erosions or ulcerations. And again, in that top right picture, there is an erosion going across the surface of that BCC. It's just a breakdown in the skin surface. We will often see blue-gray globules or ovoid nests, which we can see again in that top right one. And that tells us that there is pigment, which is in the dermis. So it looks blue. If you're seeing pigment that looks blue, that's basically because it's being bent as it goes through. The light is being bent as it goes through the skin. So it's the same reason why the sky looks blue is why melanin, which is brown, looks blue when you see it through those layers of the skin. And the pigment in, in BCCs actually is melanin as well. It's just not in melanocytes. Other features that we will see in non-superficial BCCs are white blotches and strands in polarised mode, and you can see that particularly well in that picture on the bottom left. You may also see those with non-polarised demoscopy. Sorry, you may also see those in superficial BCCs. You won't see them with non-polarised demoscopy, um, and they're not specific. They don't tell you how thick the BCC is. And then the final feature of non-superficial BCCs is May globules, and they're demonstrated in that picture on the bottom right. We'll see those with both polarised and non-polarised light, and they are those small yellowish white um, globules. So May stands for multiple aggregated yellow white, and they are little focuses, little foci of microcalcification within this skin cancer. So that's your non-superficial BCCs. And as you will see, there are no marshmallows there. And here we have superficial BCCs. So superficial BCCs generally are going to be flat. And we may sometimes just see pinky white structureless areas. We'll commonly see multiple, often small erosions. And if we see any vessels at all, they should be very short, fine vessels that are sharply focused. We may sometimes see some fine looped vessels at the peripheral edge as well. Sometimes we'll see shiny white strands or blotches with polarised demoscopy, but as I say, that doesn't tell you how thick the BCC is. And we will often see pigment structures within BCCs, but they will always be brown. So you may see concentric structures where you have a darker area in the middle and a paler brown area around the outside. You may see spoke wheels or leaf-like areas where you have these sort of finger-like projections sometimes, which are usually quite wide, coming from a, a common point like we can see in that top BCC there. But we will never see a pigment network in a BCC. If you're looking at a pigment network, then you need to be thinking that this lesion is not a BCC. It's more likely to be a melanocytic lesion. Superficial BCCs will have no blue, grey or may. Those are all signs that it's in the dermis and that it's a deeper thing. There will be no true arborizing vessels and there will be no large ulcerations. And so long as you have none of those features, you know then that you have all the options open for you for treating a superficial BCC. So you can treat it surgically or medically, or indeed for some of them, and particularly if the patients are old and frail, you can leave them alone. So that's your BCCs. 
Now, one of the things that I mentioned there was that we will never see a network, pigment network in a BCC. And that's because a pigment network is one of the features of a melanocytic lesion. When we're talking about melanocytic lesions, what we are talking about is we're talking about lesions that are made up with the primary cell type being the melanocyte, which is the factory cell that makes melanin within the skin. Most of the skin cells are keratinocytes, which are not making melanin, but they're just holding the melanin that's been made in the factory cells. And these signs that give us a clue to the fact that the cell type might be a melanocyte are pigment network, globules, which are brown and sit next to each other. So we call them aggregated globules. Structureless blue, particularly where structureless blue is all that you see within the lesion. That's what we see with the blue nevus and streaks, as we can see on the bottom left there. And one of the things with streaks, just to be aware of, so streaks are lines coming out um, of the lesion. And when you see streaks, that is a feature of malignancy. That's not a benign thing. And so if you see a lesion with streaks, it needs to be excised, particularly beyond puberty. Occasionally, you will see a type of nevus that looks like this, bottom left, in children, prepubertal, but that still needs to be referred because those are streaks. So those are, in fact, in this one, all benign lesions, but that bottom left one, just be aware of the streaks as a, as a potential malignant problem. So there are also some clues we can look for to melanoma. And the main and most important clue is asymmetry. And here we are talking about asymmetry of colour or of pattern or indeed of abruptness of the border. So whether you can see the border easily or not easily all the way around. When we talk about symmetry here, we're talking about concentric symmetry. And the way I like to think about this is that if you cut it up like a pizza, does everyone get the same topping? And in this case, if you cut it like pizza, the person that gets the bit from the bottom just gets black, whereas the person that gets the bit from the right hand side will get black and brown. So that's not fair. So that's asymmetrical. Next feature is an atypical network. And by atypical network, we mean a network which is not the same. It's not symmetrical across the whole lesion or different types of network within a lesion or a network where the lines are thicker than the holes. And I'm just going to zoom in on that a little bit for you. So you can see there that the lines there are thicker than the holes. So that rather than looking like a sieve, like that original um, nevus looked like, this looks more like a colander with the thicker lines. Now, there are other lines that can give us a clue to melanoma. And these are white lines that are seen with polarized demoscopy in particular. And if you see a lesion with white lines in, it doesn't mean it's definitely a melanoma. But if you have a melanocytic lesion with lots of white lines in, then melanoma is definitely on your list, probably top of your list of differentials. Streaks I'd mentioned before, and in that first picture where I showed you streaks, they were going all the way round symmetrically. Here we can see some asymmetrical streaks. They're coming down towards the bottom right hand side there. And that's the direction in which this melanoma is growing. Sometimes you just have completely irregular pigmentation and you look at it and you think, what's that? How can you possibly know what that is? If you're not sure what it is and it's a pigmented lesion, then melanoma has definitely got to be top of your list. We'll also see these blue-grey structures. So this is an example of blue-white veil. And as Philippa was saying earlier, blue-white veil is something that you can only see with non-polarised demoscopy because as soon as you turn on the polarisation, you'll get a polarisation artefact here and it will show up as white lines, which again are a clue to melanoma anyway. The next clue for us to be aware of is these polymorphous vessels. So by that, I mean that we can see different types of vessel within the same lesion. Looking at this one clinically, we might expect it to be possibly a BCC maybe. So we put the scope on expecting to see some arborizing tree-like vessels. But that's not what we're seeing here. Here we're seeing some linear vessels, we're seeing some helical squiggly vessels, we're seeing some looped vessels and some dotted vessels. Different vessel types within the same lesion suggest that it's either a melanoma or some other nasty life-threatening tumour. And then the final clue to melanoma is probably the scariest one. It's this one. It's where you just don't know what else it is. So if you have something that stands out as an ugly duckling, and you can't give it a definite benign diagnosis, 
and there aren't really any of those features that I've come up with before, then it could potentially be what we call an unspecific pattern melanoma. There'll be the odd one from time to time that will catch us all out. And these are the scariest ones of the lot. But hopefully you'll be able to pick out the easy melanomas from the things that we've given you so far. So I'm going to hand back to Philippa now. Thanks so much, Chin. That was an excellent summary. Thank you. I mentioned that we'd like to make these particularly interactive. So we're now going to have our final round and, and final interactive game show of should it stay or should it go? Now, again, rest assured, you're anonymized. It is one of those quick fire rounds, actually. So as soon as you feel you know the answer, please feel free just to click away. So no particular history that's conclusive for any of these lesions that we're about to show. But what we're looking at then is a clinical photo and our dermoscopy image. And we're looking, can we reassure our patient? Can this lesion stay? Or looking at these images, does this lesion need to go? Do we need to refer? So we're going to have a look at these polls to see how we're moving. Thank you, everyone. Brilliant. And I'm just going to move them along now. That was excellent. Thank you so much, everyone. That was a fantastic response. Yeah, completely agree. And, and I think brilliant responses coming through there. So these are adamatic fibromas. This is a particularly nice photo of adamatic fibroma. We can see that central white structural scar-like pattern that peripheral pigment network there as well. Second round of should it stay or should it go? Same again, can we reassure our patient, can this stay? Or do we need to refer our patient, does it need to go? What are your thoughts? And we're gonna have a look through with the poll again. And let's move this along. Thank you. That's really very sensible differentials we've got coming through here. So this one, sadly, this is a melanoma. And this one needs to go through on our two week wait criteria. What we're looking for then is that asymmetry of color and pattern. We've got an atypical pigment network at one o'clock. We've got some irregularly distributed peripheral globules, shiny white lines, some streaks, and those blue gray structures. Final round, everyone, of should it stay or should it go? What do we think? Can we reassure or do we need to refer? Let's have a look. And I'm going to move these poles along. I said it's quick fire round, so let's have a look. Oh, I moved them along a little bit too quickly. Sorry, everyone. But this one was our seborrheic keratosis. So this is our SEBK. So we've got our multiple um, milia-like cysts and your comedia-like openings. I'm sure you would have got that one anyway. So I'm going to hand over to Will to run us through some of our key Q&As. Um, just before, if you have a minute just to pop in the chat, your main learning points from this evening, we'd love to hear from you. And I'll hand over to Will now. Thanks, Will. Thanks, everyone, for your great questions. What's the difference between between streaks and finger-like projections. Broadly speaking, there's so much language in, in dermoscopy and dermatology as a whole. Uh, there's the kind of different American systems and British terminology that you'll find being used. But uh, broadly speaking, they're the same thing. If you see a lesion that's pigmented and it's got these angry looking projections that come out, it's sticking out of the edge of it, that's a bad sign. Normally a harbinger for melanoma. Normal healthy nevi tend to have a, a homogenous pigment network that fades at the periphery. So those angry projections or streaks are usually a sign of melanoma. What's the difference between pyogenic granuloma and hemangiomas? Uh, I mean, pyogenic granulomas, as, as Philip alluded to, are, are largely featureless. There's this kind of uh, pinky texture to them, but they're, they're very nonspecific. Whereas your your um, hemangiomas, have, you have these beautiful like lacunae, these like these kind of blobs of of blood vessels that you can see, and it's one of those those, those when you first see it, you'll 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 never miss it again. Equally with Seb K's, they have that the classical um, uh, features, and and when you start recognizing those, and you start being able to confidently positively diagnose benign lesions. That's the big early win that you can get with, with dermoscopy. And I definitely, um, expanding on that, I definitely recommend focusing on your benign lesions first before you then start trying to rule out melanoma. That's a much, much harder skill um, to master. And the final comment, so we are pressed for time, the final comment I wanted to pick up on is, what about lesions on dark skin? So many of you have mentioned this. I'm afraid across the the dermatology sphere, all the books, all the image banks are all very 
weighted, heavily weighted towards Caucasian skin. It is a universal problem. Um, broadly speaking, the features are the same in types five and six Fitzpatrick skin, so Asian and black skin, uh, but some features are harder to spot, particularly vessels and, and pigment look different to the untrained eye. And I just wanted to quickly just bring Chin in on this moment. Chin, what are the key differences in our uh, colleagues here who will be seeing non-Caucasian skin and, and how they should be interpreting what they're seeing down in dermatoscope? Yeah, much of it is the same with just more pigment around, so you can't see the vessels so easily. Um, there are a few key differences. So, for example, BCCs can look very much more heavily pigmented and can mimic melanomas much more in pigmented skin. Melanoma is much rarer in pigmented skin, and so it's more likely that the lesions are BCC, but we will tend to refer them on a two-week wait. But you know what? That's okay anyway, because a heavily pigmented BCC, that's always going to be your differential diagnosis is melanoma. So in general, things look pretty much the same, but just with more pigment in them. And if people are seeing lots of um, people with darker skin types and you're thinking, actually, I've got some really good clinical photos that would be great for sharing, have a look on the PCDS website. We have a consent form on there that anyone can use for anything anyway. But that also um, tells you exactly how to send us pictures to upload to the website so that we can get some of those pictures in as well. Yeah, great stuff, Chin. Thanks for those thoughts. Philippa, I'll pass the baton back to you to, to close, us, close down the session. Thank you so much both and just the biggest thank you to Will and Tim for their contributions there and a huge thank you to each and every one of you. We've had the best evening and your engagement has been incredible so thank you. Just a reminder then to have a look at the fantastic Primary Care Dermatology website and on this you will see as Chin's already mentioned which dermatoscope to use how to use those dermatoscopes, and perhaps most importantly, how to take a good quality image to send through to our fantastic dermatology colleagues. The Primary Care Dermatology Society are running a dermoscopy course for absolute beginners. This is available based face-to-face -face and as a webinar version. And they also have a live webinar version for this particular webinar on the 1st of February, 2024. Will and I will be back on your screens as well on the 19th of January. And we're running our Dermatology for Primary Care, where we cover lots of very common conditions we see in general practice on a day-to-day -day basis. We've had the best evening and thank you so much for joining us. There will be a two minute feedback form at the end and we'd love any contributions and recommendations you can suggest. We hope to see you all soon. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks, bye.